Thank you, Roy. Uh, you know, I'm really pleased to be here to tell you about some of the exciting developments at, at Inovio. And I'm really looking forward to a little fireside chat at the end of this to answer as many questions uh, as I can. So, the, uh, you know, if there's two things that I'd like people to take away after this really stimulating day we've had, uh, it's that this is an amazing time for cancer immunotherapy. And I think what you've heard through a number of presentations is that when it comes to checkpoint inhibitors, when it comes to CAR T cells, there is not a shadow of doubt left remaining that if you generate the right kinds of T cells in the right quantities, you are going to make an impact on cancer. Uh, and the second point I'd like to leave you with is that at Inovio, we have developed the science, the technology, and now the clinical data to support just exactly that. We've shown that we can, uh, we can generate antigen-specific T cells uh, through a, essentially a, a vaccination or active immunotherapy approach we can deliver them to the, uh, they can traffic to the sites of infection or sites of the lesions, clear the lesions and, and demonstrate efficacy. So, uh, so that's, that's the exciting part. So now we, if I can get into some of the nuts and bolts, how do we do it? So I think we know it's all about the T cells. And for us at Inovio, you know, the process starts out, uh, the, the approach we have taken is to use DNA plasmids to encode the highly optimized antigens. Now these are, these are simple DNA plasmids with highly optimized antigens that are then delivered into the tissue of choice, which might be the muscle or the skin. And the body then serves, to, uh, serves as its own bioreactor. We get, uh, we get high levels of antigen expression, antigen processing, presentation, all of this happens in vivo. So there's no ex vivo manipulations with our technology. And then these drive both the humoral and cellular immune responses that, you, that, that are desired. We have now taken this approach a little further where if we can use the body's cellular machinery to, to drive antigen expression for immunization or immunotherapy, we can also, through a different engineered approach, use the same, uh, same machinery to drive the production of therapeutic proteins in vivo. And this is, this is a program that we have recently published on where we have shown we can take monoclonal antibody encoding genes, deliver them into, into, into animals, and we can uh, protect them from challenge against uh, you know, lethal diseases as well as, as well as tumors. So stay tuned for further developments on the monoclonal area. Today I want to stay focused on the, on the idea that we can drive strong T cells. So we recently announced, uh, late last fall, our successful phase two efficacy results. This was a large multi-center randomized placebo-controlled uh, study, uh, a global study across multiple countries, where we enrolled women who had SYN2, SYN3 lesions, cervical lesions, and they were treated with a three-dose regimen using our uh, anti-HPV uh, immunotherapy. And what we show, the, en the end point of this study was to look for clearance of lesions. It's a regression at six months post completion of the immunotherapy. So what we showed was that in about half of the women, we regressed lesions, and these lesions regressed, uh, no and they regressed to normal. We also showed, a sec which was a secondary end point, that not only did we regress those lesions, but we also cleared the HPV virus that was the underlying cause of these lesions. So if you take a step back, uh, you know, untreated HPV infection leads to cervical lesions. Untreated cervical lesions lead to cervical cancer. So that causality has been established with beyond a shadow of doubt. The option of today, if a, if a woman presents to, to her gynecologist with cervical lesions, the only option she has is watchful waiting or surgery. And surgery, surgery here is, is an invasive procedure where basically the, the physician's going in and removing pieces of the cervix. There is no other alternative. And so what Inovio is trying to do is provide the patient, provide the physician a third choice. This would be a choice where rather than watchful waiting and its associated anxiety that you're now, you may or may not uh, regress, you're providing an immunotherapeutic approach to try to clear the, the lesions and clear the underlying cause of infection, which surgery is not able to do. So surgery clears the lesions, but does not clear the HPV. So that's, that's what drives us towards our, our patient-focused product programs. The, uh, the, uh, so, so the bottom line here is that we are developing a non-surgical 
and again, this is important, a non-patient-specific immunotherapeutic approach to treating disease. Uh, the, uh, we have now begun to expand this program into HPV-related cancers. So we've got studies ongoing in the area of uh, cervical cancer. We've got studies, phase, phase 1B, 2A studies going on in the area of head and neck cancer. And then uh, this is also important implications in clearing other virus-associated uh, diseases, such as our hepatitis B program, which is in, we have partnered with Roche. Uh, we, we, we've also got active programs in Hep C as well as in HIV. Uh, and so our ability to clear virus harboring cells as demonstrated in this study is, is quite exciting to us. Uh, one other piece I wanted to share with you, I think uh, uh, in, in terms of antigen-specific immunotherapy, not only do you need to produce those T cells, they also need to go where the, where the cancerous cells are or the infection or the site of infection. So here's one snapshot from our HPV study where th there's four uh, biopsy specimens, tissue samples, uh, in a vaccinated patient. The top panel on the left shows the epithelium and the stroma in a woman who was enrolled into the study at day zero. So prior to, in, prior to treatment, all the brown stuff you see up there is P16 staining, and P16 is a marker for HPV replication. So you see a whole lot of HPV in the cervix. Uh, Post-treatment at week 36, that's a lower panel. All of, that H, all of that brown stuff is gone. There's no HPV left. It's, it's, it's clearance of the virus. On the right, which is the other important hallmark for immunotherapy is, are you producing CD8 T cells and are those CD8 T cells getting to where they need to go to? So the top panel on, on the right is the same specimen. Now instead of staining for P16, we have stained for CD8 T cells. And, it, and what you see are those brown spots. So there's a few brown spots. Remember, these are infected women, so the, the body's immune system will produce some cells. There's a few brown spots that are mostly in the stroma but clean in the epithelium, and, and it's not surprising that there's viral replication going on over there. The bottom panel is the same patient at week 36. This is a woman who regressed. You see lots and lots of brown spots, in, not only in the stroma, but these brown spots have also infiltrated into the, into the epithelium. So we are, we are now seeing real evidence that vaccination in the periphery is driving T cell responses, which can be measured in the blood, to the site of infection, in this case, the cervix, and, and we are seeing tissue infiltrating lymphocytes. So again, some of the major goals for immunotherapy. I'd like to close by just giving you a sense of the expanded uh, product plat uh, pipeline at an OVO. Our lead program is a phase, is in, has completed phase two in the area of high-grade cervical dysplasia. We are gearing up to uh, initiate our phase three studies uh, rapidly. Uh, beyond that, we have phase 1B, 2A studies ongoing in head and neck and cervical cancer. Uh, as well as we've got a program in, uh, in breast, lung, pancreatic cancer that's in the clinic. Uh, we recently announced that our uh, prostate cancer program and our hepatitis B therapeutic vaccine programs have received regulatory clearance to initiate uh, clinical studies. And then there's a host of infectious disease programs uh, that are being developed largely through partnerships. So I'll, I'll close here and I'm happy to take questions. So maybe just to start broadly, um, what, what are the key advantages, disadvantages of your platform versus other, I guess, ways of introdu introducing genetic information into the body? You can include CAR T cells if you want, <laughs> as broad uh, as you wish. So, so that's, that's a loaded question, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll say it uh, and, and, and I'll respond to it by saying that uh, you know, ultimately, everybody starts out with a DNA plasmid. Whether you're using a viral vector or you're using, uh, you know, uh, somehow you need to get this genetic material into your vector for delivering the payloads into people. So whether it's in the, in the T-cell approach or it's in the, in the CAR T-cell approach or it's in the AAV approaches or, or any of the viral vector platforms, everybody starts out with a, with a DNA or an RNA or some nucleic acid strand encoding the gene of interest. There's molecular biology you do to get that uh, payload into your vector and then, you, and then you process the vector and then you deliver the vector. So what we have done is we have cut out the middle steps. We're taking the DNA strand directly and using the, the host, 
as, as a source of doing everything downstream from the initial generation of the, of, of the vector. So why is that important? That's important because the only payload that's being delivered to your subject of interest, in this case, clearly we're all interested in people uh, and, and patients, is the antigen, antigenic insert. So there's no off-target uh, off or off-vector immune responses that are produced that might uh, you know, yield to once-and-done type approaches. With DNA vaccination, we have been able to show that you can do multiple repeat boosting, you can drive memory responses, you can combine antigens, uh, and, and certainly the ease of manufacturing is, is a significant benefit. Are, are the plasmids in, intended to stick around, or are they supposed to be transient? Um, yeah. Ah, so, uh, I mean, that's a great question. So the, the answer to that is, and this is where the power of genetic engineering uh, is, is, is critical. So for our vaccine approaches, we have designed these vectors and our, and our target antigens so that the plasmid does not stick around. The goal here is you're, you're driving antigenic expression at the site of injection to produce the antigens, process them, present them to the immune system, drive an immune response, create a memory response, and you don't want your antigenic payload to stick around. So, but for the gene therapy approaches, you know, we have, we have developed vectors where, where the goal is gonna be persistent expression because you want, uh, you want to produce proteins which are then the therapeutic proteins such as our monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and there the, we have engineered vectors where you can, you can produce uh, therapeutic proteins for extended expression. But for immunotherapy approaches, uh, ne by necessity for safety uh, to, to, in, to have a fabulous safety profile, we make sure that the plasmids don't stick around. All right, since you mentioned it, the, the monoclonal antibody program, are, are, what are your plans with uh, next steps with that, I guess, in the near term? Um, and do you plan to mostly partner it, keep it internal? What do you think? Maybe this. Uh, so that's, I mean, uh, that's, that's a great question. The, uh, so we, we, we announced late last year that we were funded uh, from, by DARPA to further develop this monoclonal antibody technology. This is a collaboration with, uh, with Un University of Pennsylvania and Metamune. Uh, we got a grant of, of about $12 million to explore the possibility of developing DNA-encoded monoclonal antibodies, which would be broadly neutralizing for influenza and uh, you know, antibiotic resistance bacterial infections. So that's, that's where we are we're using the funding to develop proof of concept uh, data. We have shown and now we have published in, in preclinical animal studies that we can indeed protect animals from challenge, from a lethal challenge using monoclonal antibodies encoded by the DNA. Uh, but we look forward to translating that into higher animals and then cl human clinical studies. I think we had a question in the audience. Yeah, I, I, uh, I realize this is not a near term event, but I, will, I too wanted to ask about the uh, So we don't, uh, I mean, that, that remains to be seen. Uh, we, in our small animal studies, we have not noted that uh, because these, these would be the, uh, you know, human antibodies. All we are doing is produce, is encoding the human antibody DNA sequence into the plasmid and giving them to humans. So to the extent that they're, they're treated as self-proteins, we, we do believe that we're not changing the immune system in that regards. Okay, um, all right. So, <clears throat> all right, maybe the, the main non, uh, or the main partner program, the Roche HPV program, you've got a milestone coming up for enrollment on that. Have you guys disclosed how big that is and what other milestones can we expect? So we have not disclosed the the, the amount of the milestone, uh, it's, you know, it's at the time that Roche, uh, but I, I, I would like to add that this was, you know, this is a, a preclinical, neoclinical program that Roche licensed with, with in combination with Roche and Inovio, we have, we have now taken this and we announced that uh, we have received the regulatory approval and the milestone is tied towards initiation of the clinical studies. But, but yes, it is, it is a, uh, you know, it's a significant milestone. Okay, great. I think we are out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you.